Hello, it's Jeannie. How are you? I truly hope you're doing well. And for those of you who have additional stresses in life, in your circumstances, in your health, in just your everyday living. I hope this little bit of blah blah blah, kind of a potpourri blah blah vlog, <laughs> helps you just to escape and relax a little bit. That's my 100% intention. It's just to bring a little relaxation to your world. Now, that being said, I'm going to ask for help if you are a history buff because after I was, you know, in recovering from, you know, being sick, gunky stuff, in going through the house afterwards, I like to, after I've been sick, I like to clean, like just clean countertops, clean everything, try to kill any bug, any virus, any germs that are left behind. So being down for a week and a half, two weeks, I feel so behind. And so that's what I've been doing is trying to catch up around here, deep clean, sanitize, you know, just get rid of anything. Now, my mom is still super healthy. That woman has such an amazing foundation of, of strength. And the thing about my mom too, is she's been through a lot in her life, not only with various losses, of course, both her sons and her husband, but just um, accidents, you know? She, she doesn't swim, she can't swim, she can dog paddle a little bit. And one time my dad and she were out in the Pacific Ocean off Santa Cruz in a rowboat with a friend and a wave knocked the boat over and my mom went flying but because she was about six or seven months pregnant she was really buoyant and uh, so she didn't drown. I mean asking her about some of these stories they're so funny. Motorcycle accidents you know being on the back of my dad's motorcycle um, you know, he locked up the brakes one time coming down Mount Hamilton Road, which if you're familiar with the San Jose area, you know Mount Hamilton. And he locked up the brakes and hit some gravel. And she went flying, didn't go over the cliff, which she could have, but, you know, came home all scratched up and, and road rashed. Um, she has had so many crazy accidents like that. We joke that my father was trying to kill her. <laughs> he wasn't. It was just crazy accidents. So anyway, she missed getting sick and I'm very, very happy about that because at, you know, in her mid eighties, I, I don't want her getting anything. So anyway, while I've been sorting through and cleaning the house and sanitizing. I've been going through one of the guest rooms where we've been storing lots of the stuff that came from her house and is now at my house. And everything takes up space. And so I'm really grappling with, you know, what, what do I keep? And if I keep it, what do I do with it? You know, um, or should I just directly give it to the kids right away? That's sounding better and better. And I think I'm going to give them each a, a, 
pile of things and just say, hey, look, here's some great family history. You know, it's time you did whatever you want to do with it. Anyway, one of the things that I got from her house, which I know was from my grandmother and actually from her mother on my dad's side, so my dad's grandmother. My dad's grandmother lived in Skagway, Alaska in the late 1890s. You know, it was uh, that Klondike gold rush time. And if that's why they were there, I don't know. But um, there's a picture that has been handed down. And I've seen it at my grandmother's house and it just didn't mean anything to me. Well, I found this picture and in it, I'll show this to you. Okay, it's a little log cabin in Skagway and it says on the corner, Skagway, Alaska, 1995. Could be a 1996. Anyway, the thing that my grandmother used to kind of crow about was in this picture, besides my great-grandmother standing in the doorway, right there, and this is her husband right there, there are two men and one of the men is supposedly Soapy Smith. So, that never meant anything to me. Um, I see my grandmother, I can, my great-grandmother, I can tell that's her. And so I was looking at this picture that I just came across, and to the tape to the back of it, was an envelope, an article about who Sm Soapy Smith was. I'll read this, it's short. July 4th. 1898 was a day of triumph for Jefferson Randolph, quote-unquote, Soapy Smith. Spurring his horse down the streets of Skagway, Alaska, as Grand Marshal of the Independence Day Parade, he was, in the words of many, the uncrowned king of Skagway. Little did he know that in four days he would be lying dead in the gold rush town he had ruled. Soapy was a genius of organization. Um, he seemed to have had the brilliant makings of a brilliant CEO. Born in Georgia, he claimed to be the scion of an arist arist aristocratic Southern family. While that claim is subject to doubt, he did possess a genuine charm and even greater shrewdness. He earned his name performing a con involving bars of soap wrapped up with supposed $20 bills in the mining camps of Colorado. But it was in Skagway, gateway to the Klondike goldfields, that Soapy achieved his criminal Apotheosis. Assembling a motley collection of con men, Soapy devised dozens of clever ploys. Perhaps the most outrageous was his telegraph office, where he would charge five dollars for a telegram sent anywhere in the world. Never mind that Skagway was not yet connected by telegraph wire. The hapless tenderfeet would receive a message back, the cats, 
invariably a plea to wire more money home. Soapy was smart enough to mainly... Soapy... Soapy was smart enough mainly to fleece transient miners and cunning enough to gain influence in town by means of bribes, philanthropy, and a network of spies. He hobnobbed with politicos, he dreamed of a higher office for himself, but others in Skagway business community feared Soapy's shenanigans would undermine the town's commercial reputation. They formed the Vigilante Committee 101 of 101. In July 8th of 1898, Smith's men conned a prospector who complained loudly about his losses for the committee of 101. This was the last straw. Led by city engineer Frank Reed, the vigilantes moved to rid Skagway of its king. And late on the twilight Alaskan summer night, Soapy confronted Reed on the Juno Company Wharf. Four shots were fired. Soapy expired almost instantly. Frank Reed took 12, ta 12 days to die, and he was buried a hero. Soapy's body was left unclaimed until a Presbyterian minister showed up at the morgue to deliver a bleak eulogy. The way of the transgressor is hard before escorting him to an unmarked grave. So I did a little looking around on the internet, thank you Google, and read about Soapy Smith and his hustling, his conning, and, <laughs> and I think, okay, good, great friend of the family, great grandma. So anyway, if you know, and this is where I ask you history buffs, if you know anything um, as to which of these two men would be Soapy Smith. Now, the pictures I see on the internet, he has a beard in most of them. In these, in this photograph, they're not they don't have a beard, so let me show you again. I think it's the guy to the right of my grandmother in the doorway holding the baby. I think it's him. Anyway, I'll put a picture in there. And so this is something that was handed down to my grandmother from her mother saying that he was, um, you know, somebody they knew. And whether he fleeced them or, you know, what, I don't know. Anyway, I thought that was really interesting. Soapy Smith. So that was one of the treasures I found. And then more and more. Kitty. Kitty. Lots and lots of postcards, postcard albums, um, photos that, like this one, well preserved. The only identifying marker on it was that it said WW1, World War One. Hold on, the cat. I need to come in and say hi. Hello. This is my handsome boy. We'll see how long he lasts in here. Anyway, it says World War One. And at first I thought, I, 
I don't recognize these men, but then one of them does stand out who looks a lot like my dad. And I'm wondering if it, is, if it isn't his dad. And I have no one to ask, so, um, but I think this guy looks just like my dad, who could be maybe my great-grandfather, or my grandfather, this guy. how to find out. So that's a little bit of a mystery. Um, finding old postcard books. This is selected views of Los Angeles and the, the vicinity. Lots of old pictures. Um, around nine, early 1900s of LA and what it looked like. Now, here is a book. Leather bound. And it's in really good shape. And it is full of pictures, photographs from World War I, and these are all taken in Belgium. And the in and what's really nice is someone took the time. To put in descriptions of all the pictures. So I'll show you those. So this says, this is the interior of the church of the Notre Dame, um, destroyed by shell fire and now used as a stable by the French troops. The civilians therein are Belgian refugees. And this is Reuler's Belgium. This says, billets in church. This was used by the Germans as a prisoner of war enclosure prior to the Allies freeing the town. Now these are all from World War One. Views of ruined British tanks. Wow. Ruined tanks more.
placing abutments for a bridge over a canal. Now, if you're a history buff, World War I, these, you know, pictures are pretty amazing, I suppose, you know. I get a little sad looking at them. Companies I, K, and M, um, 363rd Infantry, lying in reserve. Observation post. The graves of soldiers alongside the dugouts where the fighting men sleep. Cigarette Butte, I don't know where that is. Wow, this shows the destructive force of an exploding shell. Scenes of Belgium refugees returning to their homes with the few remaining personal belongings which they were able to take from their homes before the occupation in 1914. The king and queen of Belgium returned for the, to their palace for the first time in four years. And this was taken November 22nd, 1918. And there is King Albert out on the balcony in Brussels. The, what they used, the kind of crude machine. Okay. Here's General J.J. Pershing leaving a dugout of Major General Johnston after a conference. Another of General Pershing and Johnston. Anyway. I won't go through every single one, but I just thought this was a really interesting um, album, you know, full of, full of history. This is all from Belgium. I came across uh, this old sewing kit. This was my mom's sewing kit in the 60s. And you know what the number one thing is that she has in here? Buttons. Lots and lots and jars of buttons. Yep. And more buttons. <laughs> and thimbles. Oh my, these are old. Look at this. The old thimble. Look at this. An Ireland patch. I don't it looks like that got taken off of something, so I don't 
Oh, look at this. <clears throat> this is cool. It's a needle kit, courtesy of Farmer's Insurance Group. Wow, that's still in really good shape. Look at this. Hmm. So, going through things like this, I can add these buttons to my buttons. But all these things take up space. See, look at this. So, some other things that I found. And I'm starting to put things in plastic bags to protect them and I hope I'm doing the right thing. Uh, look at this book here. This is leather. This beautiful embossed, like a stamped leather. Whoops, I had it upside down. There's some kind of crest. I don't know if you can see it or not. But it's this really beautiful greenish dark blue. And look at these postcards in These are all stitched and they've got little rhinestones. Those are so beautiful. Arc de Triomphe, Versailles, oh my goodness, look at this view of Paris, Notre Dame. Sacre Coeur. Eiffel Tower. Look at the cars. All these old cars. Carmel by the sea. Okay. This is such a beautiful, beautiful postcard album. <sighs> so, I've got my Earl Grey in my Starbucks Puerto Vallarta cup and um, that's uh, we're gonna be heading there in a few weeks with some friends who are coming out from Germany and we're really looking forward to that trip and a couple of our kids will be there with their wives and um, a bunch of friends as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. I love Puerto Vallarta. Anyway, 
I hope you enjoyed looking through some of these old things with me. I enjoy looking through them. And now I need to make some decisions about what to do with them. And someone mentioned, um, you know, historical societies, and that's actually a good, a good option. Heck, you know, maybe there's somebody who collects this stuff and would want to buy them. I don't know. Um, so, I hope the blah 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 was a little interesting and relaxing. Um, um, a cousin of mine sent me something from an author named John Rodell or Redell, R O E D E L. And his story is quite interesting. He was going through some challenges of faith and started just typing on Facebook as if he was writing to God. Dear God. And then he got inspired and decided to write back as if he were God. And what would God probably say to him? And there's one particular piece he wrote, and he created a, a, a collection, and actually they're in print, you can order his books. But he created one, he, he did one that I love, and I'll read this to you. It's on my phone so I can make it big. Me. Hey, God. God. Hello. I'm falling apart. Can you put me back together? God says, I would rather not. Why? Because you aren't a puzzle. God says, What about all the pieces of my life that are falling down onto the ground? God says, let them stay there for a while. They fell off for a reason. Take some time and decide if you need any of those pieces back. You don't understand. I'm breaking down. God says, no. You don't understand. You are breaking through. What you are feeling are just growing pains. You are shedding the things and the people in your life that are holding you back. You aren't falling apart. You are falling into place. Relax. Take some deep breaths and allow those things you don't need anymore to fall off of you. Quit holding on to the pieces that don't fit you anymore. Let them fall off. Let them go. Me. Once I start doing that, what will be left of me? Only the very best pieces of you. But I'm scared of changing. I keep telling you, you aren't changing. You are becoming. Becoming who? God says, becoming who I created you to be. A person of light and love and charity and hope and courage and joy and mercy, and grace, and compassion. I made you for more than the shallow pieces you have decided to adorn yourself with, that you cling to with such greed and fear. Let those things fall off of you. I love you. Don't change. Become. Become. Become who I made you to be. I'm going to keep telling you, telling you this 
until you remember it. Me, there goes another piece. God says, yep, let it be. So I'm not broken? Of course not. But you are breaking like the dawn. It's a new day. Become. I love this. I just love this. That was very... I think it was probably a very inspiring moment for him as he sat there writing. As if God were answering him. And so to those of you who feel like pieces of your puzzle are falling away, let them. Let them. It's okay. I remember when going through some tough times in my past, I knew it was okay to be in a grieving state, to be in a mad or angry state, to be in a sad state, and all those other things. I knew those were allowed. But something that I didn't know was allowed was to smile again, to feel joy again, to laugh again. And I remember when I would first start feeling things like that something funny and laughing out loud, it felt um, like wrong. And But then something told me, no, it's not. It's okay. Anyone who has loved you and has moved on, passed away, I can say for certain that they would still want you to be joyful, happy, you know, experience great things and not live with the weight of sadness. You know, they, if they loved you, I know that that's what they would want for you. And I realized that, you know, when I lost loved ones, they still want me to be happy and live my life. And so that kind of gave me strength and permission to feel joy again doesn't mean I didn't ever feel sad, but permission to put down the heavy suitcase of grief for a while and just be okay with having a happy moment or a happy day. So anyway, So I recently hit 50,000 <laughs> subscribers and I know in the world of YouTube that isn't, you know, a major milestone, but I'm excited for it and um, I'm very grateful, grateful for it. There's no way I'm going to do a 50 question and answer thing. The 20 took forever. And it seems like just a week or so ago that I was doing the 20,000. So, wow, that's exciting. And I owe it all to you. Um, I owe it to those who have recommended me. Thank you very much. You know who you are. There's been a few of you. And, um... I'm just, I'm very, very touched, very blessed, very honored by all of you. And so I'm going to sign off for now with this potpourri, blah, 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 vloggy mishmash of stuff. And I appreciate the time you give me. I appreciate the comments. And I appreciate you. So I'll sign off for now and see you in the next video.